The Boeing 787 has been an absolute smash hit. With over 1,700 ordered to date, it's rocketed up sales charts to become the best-selling widebody of all time. But take a closer look at the 787 family, and you'll find that not all things are equal. Specifically, the 787-10 hasn't pulled its weight, trailing its Dreamliner brethren by a pretty healthy margin. Now, on the surface, this doesn't seem to make any sense. After all, planes of this size are in high demand. So, what's going on here? Why is Boeing having a hard time selling the 787-10? Let me explain. Before hopping into it, some of you may have noticed that, between this channel and my new channel Kobe Explores, I posted 4 long-form videos and 10 short-form videos in the month of January. That's more than I've ever released in a single month, and you guys really seem to enjoy it. But at the same time, I've never been more stretched thin. Between traveling, editing, and filming, I'm working upwards of 80 hours a week. With all of this work, I've had to make sacrifices in other areas of my life. One such area is cooking. I've turned to unhealthy frozen meals to keep my body fueled. But then I discovered Factor, today's sponsor. Factor delivers fresh, never frozen meals directly to my doorstep. The meals are easy to make, I just pop them in the microwave for a few minutes. And they're also nutritious, designed by chefs and dietitians. With Factor, you'll have plenty of meals to choose from, with 34 different options available weekly. And so far, my favorite has been the chili chorizo. I'm not gonna lie, I make one mean chili myself, but Factor's is nearly as tasty. If you also find that you don't have enough time to cook, clean, or go to the grocery store, give Factor a try. And if you go to factor75.com and use the code KobeExplains50, you'll get 50% off your first box Plus, you'll get free lifetime wellness shots so long as you're an active subscriber. Again, that's Kobe Explains 50. Head to the link below to give Factor a try and to help support my work. Let's kick things off today by talking about where the 787-10 fits in Boeing's commercial lineup. It is the newest and largest member of the 787 family, and with seating for around 300 passengers, it's neatly positioned to supplant the aging 777-200 and 200ER. Now, the 777-200 was a strong seller for Boeing. The company shipped nearly 600 units during its run of production, and with the oldest examples approaching 30 years in age, they are ripe for replacement. Now, the 787-10 appears to be a worthy successor. From a technological standpoint, it's a massive step up. Its extensive use of composite materials, paired with its high-bypass engines, make it about 25% more efficient. And, as a result, you'd expect it to sell like hotcakes. But that simply hasn't been the case. Just 258 units have been ordered. That figure is less than half that of the 777-200, and accounts for just 14% of the 787 order book. Now, to give Boeing some credit, having over 200 units sold is still a respectable number, and when you consider that the Dash 10 costs little to develop, the program's probably already turned a profit. But the plane just hasn't lived up to its full potential. Based on market trends and growth, it should be selling much, much better. So what's going on with the Dash 10? Why hasn't it been a hit? Well, there are two key variables that have resulted in slow sales. First, let's cover the more straightforward and less interesting of the two, competition. When the 777-200 first hit the market, it had very few challengers. The only aircraft on the market that could match its range and capacity were trijets like the MD-11 and quadjets like the A340. But the 777 is a twin jet, which makes it way more economical than either of those two aircraft. And as a result, it went mostly uncontested. But the 787-10 has no such luxury, which competes head-on with the A350-900. 
Like the 787, it's also a clean sheet design that's built primarily from composites. And while there's fierce debate over which plane burns less fuel, in reality, it's kind of a wash. Both planes are very similar in terms of efficiency. Now, all things being equal, these two aircraft should have split the market for 777 replacements. But all things weren't equal. The A350 hit the market a full seven years before the Dash 10. This massive head start helped Airbus convert many 777 operators to their side before the Dash 10 ever got a chance to win their business. In fact, Airbus sold hundreds of A350s before the Dash 10 launched, capturing much of that 777 replacement market. Okay, so it's clear that the Dash 10's late entry into the market has affected its sales. But is it the only reason that it hasn't lived up to its potential? Well, there's an easy way for us to find out. All we have to do is take a look at how the A350-900 and 787-10 have sold since the latter's introduction. If the sales figures are comparable, it would suggest that airlines value the two planes equally. So what do the numbers tell us? Well, ever since the Dash 10 was launched, the A350 has continued to outsell it, and it's done so by a healthy margin. If the two jets were truly comparable, you'd expect this figure to be much, much closer. It seems the Dash 10 suffers from another issue, and that brings us to problem number two. The 787-10 has a design shortfall. The 787-10 shares the same wing as the 787-8 and Dash 9. These two aircraft are shorter than the Dash 10, and Boeing had optimized the wing around these shrunken variants. This was done in an effort to keep development costs down, and ensure that the Dash 10 would hit the market in a timely manner. But it also means that the wing isn't optimized for its size. For some context, it's about 14% smaller than that of the 777-200, and about 20% smaller than that of the A350-900. Now, if you know anything about airplane design, you'll know that most of a plane's fuel is stored in the wing. The upshot is that the 787-10 can't fly nearly as far as the competition. The A350-900 completely outclasses it, flying nearly 2,000 nautical miles further. Even the outdated 777-200ER beats it by a healthy amount. Now, this lack of range has hurt the plane's value proposition. Specifically, it's unable to fly many Trans-Pacific missions. This is a huge missed opportunity for Boeing, since Trans-Pacific flights have exploded in popularity. It shouldn't come as a shock, then, that Asian carriers like Cathay Pacific, Air China, Asiana, and Starlux have chosen the A350 to address their high-capacity Trans-Pacific needs. Okay, so it's clear that Boeing needs to do something to address this problem. And I don't know about you, but my gut reaction is they should build a 787-10ER. In order to realize this new variant, Boeing engineers would have to add extra fuel tanks to the plane's belly. This would cut down on cargo capacity, but it could deliver a lot more range. For instance, when Boeing built the 777-200ER, it added about 1,800 nautical miles of range over the regular 777-200. A similar improvement for the Dash 10 would bring it right in line with the A350-900. But building the ER is easier said than done. You see, the Dash 10 didn't just borrow its wing from the Dash 8 and Dash 9. It also borrowed the landing gear. It would seem that this gear can't handle the extra weight that comes with loading extra fuel. And at the end of the day, Boeing may need to significantly reinforce or even redesign it in order to bring about an ER version. So, for the time being, Boeing doesn't seem all that keen to build an ER. And to be honest, you can't really blame them. Its focus and resources are trained on completing 777X, MAX 7, and MAX 10 certification, and also sorting out some production issues. But that doesn't mean that Boeing's doing nothing to address this performance gap. Rather, they're making a few targeted tweaks in order to unlock more range. At this summer's Paris Air Show, I sat down with Darren Holst, 
Boeing's VP of Commercial Marketing. And I asked him what changes are actually being made and how they make the jet more competitive. Here's what he had to say about those efforts. From a structural standpoint, very little structural changes to the aircraft, a little strengthening to the gear, a little strengthening locally. And what that does is gives the 787-10 about 500 nautical miles more range. Mm -hmm. The reason why that's significant is it puts it right on top of the capability of the 200ER. Yeah. And it completes sort of what the 787-10 can do. Sure. Um, it's not just a transatlantic airplane, it's a trans-Pacific airplane. And so it becomes extremely versatile in the networks that our airline customers need. And we're really close in, in, in entering the service of the first type that has the increased max takeoff weight capability will be sometime late next year. Okay. So we're you know, just over a year away from that. And we don't have yeah. to call it an ER, it's just a, a Dash 10 with a higher max takeoff weight capability. Sure. Yeah. Now, to Boeing's credit, these changes will definitely make a difference. But even so, there's still debate as to whether Boeing's making the right decision here. On one hand, you could praise Boeing for being resourceful. After all, this course of action helps the Dash 10 become a legitimate trans-Pacific workhorse without allocating a ton of resources to the project. On the other hand, you could view this approach as nothing more than a half measure, one that still leaves a big performance gap between the Dash 10 and the A350. And in recent years, airlines have used the A350's enhanced performance to open up new ultra-long routes like Singapore to San Francisco, Manila to New York, and Atlanta to Johannesburg. By all accounts, these flights have been wildly successful, and none of these missions can be flown by this altered version of the Dash 10. So, which of these two arguments is more legitimate? Is Boeing being shrewd here, or is Boeing being short-sighted? Well, for what it's worth, I think that this conservative approach will be sufficient. It's true that ultra-long routes are becoming more popular, but they still only represent a fraction of all long-haul routes. And of course, Boeing's smaller 787-9 can and does serve a number of these missions, like Sydney to Dallas, London to Perth, and New York to Auckland. While it does carry fewer passengers than the A350, the Dash 9 already does a great job of representing Boeing in this market segment. But at the end of the day, it's not up to me to decide whether Boeing is taking the right approach here. It's the airlines that are going to vote with their wallets. But so far, Boeing has received some early positive indicators, with airlines like United, Air Canada, and Qantas all placing orders for the jet in the last year. Now, I think it's still too early to determine whether these recent wins are a true sign of things to come, but I still think we need to acknowledge what Boeing is doing here. The 787-10 needed to change, and Boeing is changing it. Here's to hoping that it'll actually be enough to get the program back on track. So, what do you guys think? Is Boeing taking the right approach with the 787-10? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. Oh, and if you want to watch my whole conversation with Darren, I'll leave a link to it right below that like button. We cover all sorts of interesting topics, from the 767 MAX to the 777-10. So, if that sounds interesting to you, I highly recommend you check it out. Thank you so much to my patrons for helping to make this video possible. If you like what I do and want to help the channel grow, go ahead and check out this link right here. And as always, if you learned something new today, leave a like and subscribe to keep learning. And until I see you again, don't forget to look up.